Good. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the um, the uh, well, yes, the last talk for this track for today. Um, after this, there will be um, some fun events happening um, from about kind of five-ish onwards, um, but I'll announce those um, properly at the end. Um, so I'm not sure how many of of you know, but David Fraser um, used to be my boss um, ages ago when I was working as as a web developer, uh, and he was a great boss. Um, so actually, no, no, know him fairly well. Um, but uh, but as an introduction, I think I'm going to just read you his bio because I feel it really gets across his his style as a human, um, and and it's really fun. So uh, so David grew up mostly in Cape Town. He married an amazing woman, Danielle, and they have three children who are the bee's knees. Um, he started programming when he was pretty young, enjoyed doing maths and computer Olympiads. Uh, he's played French cricket on four continents, but not professionally. Uh, he plays the piano. He reads more about films than he watches them. He's a passionate Christian, an amateur runner, and an unlicensed guitar player. Um, he enjoys leading people and building good software. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to David um, for what I'm sure, based on past talks, is going to be a pretty fun talk about doing unexpected things with Python. Cool. Thanks, Simon. Um, Simon is a pretty great person to work with, so um, I think that it was not difficult to pretend to be his boss for a while. So, um, welcome, everyone. And today we're going to talk about something that you could say is about suitable for PyCon because it's got Py in it. And there's going to be a fair amount of Python in this talk and some other languages might squeak in along the way. Um, but this is actually a talk that um, originally centered around math. So let me explain that before any of you who are not mathematically inclined get a heart attack. So I work for um, what is now part of Hexagon. We used to be J5 Software, which is a um, company whose development center has always been here in Cape Town in South Africa. I've just remembered that somebody said that you should try not to speak too fast when you're in an online presentation. But I always speak too fast, even when I'm in a face-to-face -face situation. So um, you'll have to um, see if you can get YouTube to produce transcripts of my talk or something. Um, if I'm going too fast, please free to make, make messages in the public chat. I'll be watching them and uh, say, oh, sorry. OK. so. I, so I work for Hexagon. Um, we produce software for the industrial world, um, for oil refineries and power groups and a host of other people. And it's essentially um, the part of software that we work on is essentially managing a lot of the um, human processes that go into running an industrial plant. But um, I've always liked maths. And as a company, we've always wanted to support education in South Africa. And we've done that in various ways. It's been actually great seeing some of the emphasis on education and some of the talks at PyCon this year. One of the things that we've done is to support the UC Maths competition, uh, which some of you may know of. Um, it's a um, beyond school maths kind of competition that I think really inspires a lot of high school students um, in the Western Cape and is stretching a bit beyond to get stuck into some more problem solving. And so um, as part of that, we um, wanted to make mugs. So that's that's the basic outline. I'm going to explain how to make a mug using Python. Um, that's got some maths in it and might inspire some youth to program. And this talk was done as actually an explanation for a bunch of high school math students where I was hoping that showing them how you can use computers to calculate things and showing some of the maths at the same time might help them to see that computer science is really a branch of mathematics. And in fact, the original computer science departments and universities were like part of the maths department, um, which is just shows you how mathematical what we do is, even if you didn't think that you liked maths at school, which I didn't like maths at school either, but I like lots of other maths. Okay, so before we begin, let me give you a brief outline of this talk. So this is an outline of the talk. It's gonna be roughly circular. And I've actually got um, all of the notes for this talk in a Jupyter notebook, which I'll give you a link to at the end. So if I realize that my presentation is a little bit thin on details and every now and again I'll drag in a little window that shows you how to make the, the figures that I'm showing to you. It's quite graphical and so here's how you draw an outline of a talk um, using matplotlib um, in a little Jupyter notebook. So this circle has radius one in some kind of unit system. 
Okay, so um, what are we going to go through, just in case you might feel lost along the way, is first, how can you calculate pi by hand? Um, are there ways to estimate it? So it's kind of historical order. And then some of the calculations that were done in the ancient world, Pythagoras and Archimedes, they also used Matplotlib to draw nice graphs of their um, calculations, although the source code has been lost. Um, and then we're going to look at infinite series, just so you can draw nice nested diagrams of square root signs. And a little bit of an explanation, which was targeted at high school students, of how different number systems work. These ones, you guys, a lot of you will be familiar with them, binary and hexadecimal but we'll go into some hairier ones. And then how to use computers to calculate pi, particularly if you've got more than one of them. And then some fancier algorithms and finally coffee mugs. And um, I'll explain this piece of code to you later. But firstly, how to estimate pi by hand. So, um, I mean, if you want to work out the ra ratio between the diameter of a circle and its circumference, you can draw it with a ruler and compass. and Make sure that you know the diameter and then get a piece of string. And this is all work that I originally did, by the way, and it was very tiresome. Not really. It was surprisingly accurate. I managed to measure and work out that for my circle, using my measurements, pi was 3.17, which if any of you have memorized pi to more than two decimal places, you might know that it's slightly out, but it's not bad. The truth is, if I hadn't got such a good measurement the first time around, I would have done it again. So there's a slight bias there because I happen to know the answer. But that's one way to measure pi. It's never going to give you the true value. Um, so mathematically, we want to find the error in my ruler. Good comment. I like these comments. Please keep them coming. Um, we want to find a more mathematically precise way to get uh, an approximation to the um, size of pi. And one way to do that is to draw like polygons, because we know how to calculate the size of polygons, and we can even draw a formula for them. And so um, what's the simplest polygon you could do is a triangle, but triangles are like really non-circular. Squares are almost a little bit more circular than um, triangles. So what this is, is a diagram showing if you've got a square inscribed in a circle and a square circumscribing the circle, so one that just, just fits inside the circle and one that just contains the circle, you can calculate their sizes. And um, once you've done that, you can see that pi is between 2.828427 or so and 4 um, using some simple Pythagorean calculations. And that is useful, um, but not very accurate. In fact, using um, my piece of string and a ruler was a lot more accurate. So that's because squares are not that close to being circles, which is why most people don't use square tires in their vehicles. So you can try and make it a little bit more accurate by using a hexagon that's got a few more sides and it's also not too difficult to calculate. It's like got some of these special triangles that you learned in Pythagoras at school. And so you can get a slightly more accurate example using that. And if you put the calculations in there, you'll find that pi is between three and 3.46. So a little bit closer. This is in fact what Archimedes did, as Keith said. So. Here's something that Archimedes wrote, not himself, but it's like a really old copy of something that somebody else copied down that he wrote. And he was working out how can you use a hexagon to estimate the value of pi, like we did just now. And in fact, what he did was he calculated it using a 96-sided polygon, which involves doing a lot more square roots and complicated things. And he managed to work out that pi is between 223 over 71 and 22 over 7, which is one of those approximations to pi that you find cropping up, because it's one of the closest ones without using too high numbers for your fractions. So, um, so you can do that, right? You can increase the number of sides to your squares. Now, hexagons are a bit of a more tricky one to start with. So I started with squares and then basically started doubling the number of sides. So this is an octagon. And using that, you get pi between 3.06 and 3.31. Or you could do a 16-sided shape. Anyone know what a 16-sided shape is called? I mean, we talk about them all, all, all the time with our three-year-old at the dinner table. This is not entirely true. Um, in fact, let's go the whole hog. There's a 32-sided shape. As you can see, the values get gradually more accurate. So 32 sides, it's between 3.13 and 3.15. But what about a 2048-sided shape? 
I'm sure all of you have constructed these with ruler and compass yourself. Decaceptagon, thank you, Casey. You, um, you will win a, a virtual Decaceptagon for your efforts. That's excellent. Um, so, so using this and just some simple nested square root functions, because you're just calculating lots more little triangles, you can work out that pi is between 3.141591 and 3.141595, which for most purposes is admittedly really good enough. I mean, like if you made a circle that was actually, if you made a tire for your car that was actually a 2048-sided polygon, you wouldn't notice any perceptible increase in friction, I don't think. So, um, but mathematicians are strange creatures and so are programmers. And we, we often want to do things better just because they can be done better. So this is where the ancient world got to, and we can do it with less effort than them because we can actually write Python programs now and not lose the source code. Um, so if we just draw up a little table, this is two to the power of the number of sides we've got. Um, that's how many sides we've got and these are the lower and upper bounds we get. You can get gradually closer and closer. So um, that's as far as the ancient Greek world got in calculating pi. Um, but it actually is an example of a method that was developed later, um, which was um, which can be expressed like this. So this kind of idea of infinite, infinite series um, was developed um, by, um, by some later mathematicians in the Indian, Islamic, and later the European world. And so um, basically it says, like, just keep on doing this and keep on banging more twos in there and see what you end up with um, as you get more and more terms in the series. Um, and there's a little bit of an easier one because calculating lots and lots of square roots is difficult to do accurately, even with computers. It's like a tiresome approach. So um, this is a series that was discovered by the Indian mathematician Madhava of Sangha Magrama, whose name I have probably butchered. Um, but he worked out that you can take one, subtract one over three, add one over five, subtract one over seven. So basically you've got the odd numbers going up as your um, denominators of your fraction. And this is an accurate way of calculating pi divided by four. So if you just put fours on the top, then you can calculate pi like that. And that's great because you can do this in your head, right? You can start out with um, four and then subtract four over three and you get eight over three. And this is like mental arithmetic and you get these beautiful fractions. The problem is like if you keep on doing it, you do in fact get closer to pi and it will eventually converge. You'll eventually get the right answer. But even once you've done it a hundred times and come out with this number, um, it's not actually a very accurate estimate for pi. It's 3.13159. And I actually didn't manage to do this amount of mental arithmetic in my head. There probably are some people in the world who could do it, but I don't usually go beyond 12 digit numbers doing mental calculations and that's actually a bit of a stretch. So, um, so this is a, a good series because it's nice and easy to see and it's beautiful and you can prove it mathematically, although I don't know how. Um, but um, it was a later, so this one's it's sometimes called the, um, Leibniz series, but nowadays you generally call it the Madhava Leibniz series because it was also independently studied by Leibniz. Um, so this guy, Srinivasa Ramanujan, um, he came up with a much better formula for pi, which is obviously intuitive, right? You just look at that formula and think, yes, take two times the square root of two over 9,801, and then for every k, add 4k factorial times 1,103 plus 20, 26,390k over k factorial to the four times 396 to the 4k. Obviously, that'll be pi. I don't know how Ramanujan came up with these stuff, but they turn out to be better to use in calculations. So um, these... these these formulae are nice because they're nice to write easy, simple programs. So the, um, but have a Leibniz series, you can write a simple program like this and there you get your values of pi. Um, the, this one is similar. Um, it's also like fairly simple expressions that you just repeat. And so here's a little Python program that calculates that. Um, the problem with it, I don't know how much my video is lagging by the way, so probably me dragging things on, on off the screen may not help you. The problem with this, so th this one gets much more accurate values very quickly. So after just doing one calculation, you end up with pi correct to six or seven decimal places, which is pretty good. Um, the problem is after th three calculations, my fourth calculation is giving me exactly the same answer. Can anybody think why that might be the case? Ah, 
it is because of a dreaded problem that we all encountered when we first started programming, which is that this is these calculations I've been doing. I was doing. I can take it that we can't quite see um, the code, um, which. But let me put that on the screen again. Okay, so here I've got these calculations. I've got a little factorial function, and then this is that formula. And when I display it, I come out with the same values coming over and over again. And it turns out that that's because I'm using floating point arithmetic. And that's exactly right. It's the bit size of the number, thank you, Casey and Keith. That means that it can't actually calculate a better decimal value for the fractions that I've got because it's using limited bit size um, numbers to calculate it. And so this turns out to be a good point to, point to explain to high school students about number systems, um, which I'm going to rush through this fairly quickly because I think most of you probably know about this. But if you don't, it'll be interesting and you can read up about it later. So how do number systems work? Well, we're used to using base 10. It's got 10 different um, values for each um, digit. And then each time as you go left, you multiply by 10. But um, because computers have bits that only flip off and on and not between 10 different positions, um, we often think about things in terms of the binary number system where we've got two different values, naught and one, and as you go left, each time you multiply by two. So 2020 is written like that in binary, and it's the sum of powers of two. Or you can do a similar thing with hexadecimal, where you have 16 different numbers, and on top of naught to nine, you add A to F, and A, B, C, D, E, F represent the numbers 10 to 15, and so you multiply that by, um, this is actually entirely wrong because that should be one and two, but never mind. So hexadecimal works in the same way, binary works in the same way, and this is how computers actually calculate. Um, and so here's a little example of how we can represent negative numbers and do little calculations with them. Um, but floating points are a little bit more interesting because if you want to represent arbitrary numbers and not just be limited to a certain range that a certain number of digits can give you, then we do something that's roughly equivalent to scientific notation that you got taught at school where um, you have an exponent and you have a value. And basically you can say this is times, like you would say times 10 to the power of 200. We just got two as the base instead of that. And you have an exponent and a sign and then what's called the mantissa which is just a slightly more efficient way of storing um, the value of the number. Um, and so here we have pi represented in a floating point number. That is how many bits is this? this is about 32 bits of floating point. And we get 3.141592. And then the rest of the digits, um, it's calculated in decimal, but then not quite accurate enough because we don't have enough bits here to store more accuracy. Um, so it, it turns out that the, I was using Python's decimal um, module to um, calculate these things. Oh, sorry, I was using Python's fractions module to calculate these things. So the actual numbers I was using were fine because Python's integer handling is pretty good and it'll handle arbitrary precision integers. But I just needed to have a slightly better way to turn those into decimal um, numbers and output them to the screen. And as soon as you do that, you can see that this actually converges um, more and more like these, like all these digits. Look, all those of you who've memorized the first 30 digits of pi can see that um, this is pretty accurate. So, um, so the six digit, the six calculation here gives pi accurate to 47 digits. Um, and that's pretty useful because if you want to use a computer to calculate pi, which we're going to get onto soon, then you want it to get there quickly and not to spend too much computing time getting there. So, this is a pretty good formula. So, um, from 1946 onwards, all the records for calculating pi have been reached electronically. And even if you're really good at mental arithmetic, you won't be able to beat them. Before then, there were lots of people who managed to calculate pi by hand. You have to feel sad about some of them. Um, there was one guy who calculated pi to like, I think like a thousand digits, but he got one of them wrong and he had taken 15 years to do it. So let's rather use our electronic slaves to do it um, because then we don't waste as much of our lives. Um, and actually these calculations have roughly followed Moore's law that because the computing power of a chip has doubled every two years, um, the number of digits of pi has been able to grow astronomically. People have 
also invented new algorithms for calculating pi. So the Chernovsky brothers. Oh, so this is, I think this is Yasumasa Kanada, who's led some of the original teams that got pi to like 16 million digits and then 134 million digits and then 206 billion digits. Um, they used lots of computers. And then these are the Chernovsky brothers, and they developed an improved version of Ramanujan's algorithms, which um, converge faster and are more efficient. Um, and it looks like that. So you want to just memorize that formula. You can go and put it into your home calculator and see if you can calculate pi to a few decimal places. And then in 2019, last year, Emma Iwao from Google in Japan calculated pi to a suspicious number of 31 trillion digits, but actually it looks very much like she calculated pi times 10 to the 10 digits. And then this year, Timothy Mulliken um, was messing around with the little computer setup that he happened to have at home and calculated pi to 50 trillion digits. Um, actually, his home computer setup is probably a little bit intense. Um, so those were the ones <laughs> that he, he used. It turns out that when you're calculating this many digits of pi, all the little steps you're doing in this calculation end up having loads of bits or digits. And so a lot of the work is not actually computational power, but it's actually just writing all the different sub calculations you're doing to disk and reading them back from disk. And so having lots of high speed storage is the way to go if you wanna calculate lots of digits of pi. But most of us don't have a computer like that. And it's nice to think that we could calculate pi to many digits, so what about finding a way to calculate pi that just gives you some digits as you go? Because these ones, you've got to run the whole algorithm to a certain degree of precision, and then you get your answer printed out. So we're going to look at what are called spigot algorithms. Spigot is a British word, I think, for tap, which nobody that I know actually uses. Um, but the idea is that these algorithms can produce little digits along the way, and they're based on this kind of formula. Um, which is a way of expressing something as a sort of continued fraction, and you can express pi like that. I'm not gonna go into great detail about this, but if you're interested, basically what you use is a varying base number system. So we could use um, this kind of idea. I guess it comes up most naturally in how we deal with dates and times. Anybody else hate how computers have to deal with the human idea of date and time because it's got all these weird ideas of different numbers of days in a year, different numbers of days in a month. How about let's add a leap year and then you know what daylight savings just to make all computer programmers hate governments everywhere. But um, this is the time at which the um, my talk is scheduled to end fairly shortly um, and it's calculated as a certain number of years. I'm just using 365 even though they change a certain number of months. Uh, a certain number of um, days, and then we've got hours, which are 24ths and months. Does that make sense? So this is the date today and the time at half past four. And you can kind of see that as though this is using different bases as you go along. Like to go from here to here, instead of multiplying by 10, you multiply by 30, and then you multiply by 365 to get to there. For the so I'm using it as a kind of strange illustration. But you could imagine that you had a number system which had different bases along the way, which is quite an interesting idea to me. Why be consistent when you can be entirely crazy? So, um, so it turns out that if you use a really weird number system, pi is actually 2.22222 recurring. And that number system is the number system which has a variable base, 3 over 1, 5 over 2, 7 over 3, 9 over 4, 11 over 5. So not only does it have a variable base, but the bases of this are fractional. And that is not a number system that you would want to calculate your grocery bill with, but it is one that lets you use that fancy formula for pi to be able to turn it into a simple Python program. So this program uses that formula. The nice thing about it is that because these numbers are getting progressively smaller, you can actually calculate when they're not going to make a difference to the next decimal digit. And so what you do is you do a base conversion from this weird base into our normal decimal base and work out at which point you're accurate to a certain number of digits and then just spit it out. So, so this program, you can just give a number of digits to and shall I actually run it? Might be interesting. Um, I just closed the window that I had prepared to run it in so that it would make my presentation longer. Um, this is going to be far too small for anyone to see. 
Okay. So this is a little repository I have here. You'll see why it's called UC Maths Mug later. And I'm going to run this CalcPy Mixed Radix example, which is that program that was on the screen. And after a little bit of thought, it'll give me a thousand digits of pi, which you can check if you want to. I did actually check that it works correctly. And that's quite a simple problem. And it uses no floating point arithmetic. It's all just plain integer arithmetic and takes advantage of the fact that Python does large integer arithmetic really naturally. Um, and it calculates pi all in one go, like the others, but with a little bit of tweaking, you can adjust it to calculate pi on the go. So that's what I'm going to show you next. So um, this bit, it seems like I forgot to make slides for, but never mind. I've got the actual code, which is more exciting. Um, let's make this look bigger. And exit that. Okay, so here's a little JavaScript program that runs a similar algorithm to that and calculates pi. The reason I did it in JavaScript was I wanted to give um, the students code that they could run on their machine without having to download anything. So um, there's only one little cheat thing, which is that JavaScript's number arithmetic really sucks compared to Python. And so I used a big integer library. But other than that, this is all pure, simple JavaScript. And what it does is it calculates one digit of pi at a time and writes it into the document that contains it. So a very simple HTML page. But this is not that nice to print out on a mug. And what we were wanting to do was to produce a mug that we could show to people, give to people that had some code written on it. So this is the first version that we actually produced, um, which contains a version of that code um, laid out to look more like our old logo. So how do we do that? Well, you need to compress it a little bit, and you get some nice little um, tools that will let you compress something so you don't have long variable names and so on. Um, it's not as nice to read, but hey, it takes up less space. And then I wrote a little program to um, compress it into a nice shape. So what this does is it um, takes from standard input the, the shape you want, reads some code, and then adjusts it. Um, so this is the layout that I want to have for this version of the mug. Circle with pi in it, which is where we started. Tells you how many lines they are, and then reads in the stars, and then arranges the code in that form. So if we apply that to that, then you get something like this. And I did tweak this slightly after doing it. But, um, because it turns out that JavaScript doesn't like it, and neither do most programming languages if you just interrupt a variable name in the middle. But this is a program that will actually calculate the digits of pi. It is unspeakably badly formatted, depending on your aesthetic that you use for formatting. On the other hand, it looks quite nice. And if you open this in your web browser, which I will do just now, then you will actually have um, your web browser calculating pi for you. So. Let's do that. Um, so this is on the little repository that I have for this. Um, here's a web page. Oh, look, it's calculating pi. So that is calculating pi one digit at a time, roughly, and printing them out. And it can actually go continuously without stopping until the integer calculations it's doing make your computer run out of memory. It does get slower as it goes along because it's doing harder calculations. But it's quite satisfying that that will just print out as many digits of pi as you want it to and as your machine can handle. And we make it a bit bigger. And if you look at the source code for this, it looks like that. Cool. So that is how to calculate pi in a web page um, using some simple integer arithmetic and then print it out on a mug, which turned out to look like that. So. Nice little bit of advertising for us, for these students. Um, but also, they've got the formula there in case they ever need to prove it or um, to do anything fancy with it. And hopefully interesting for students who are interested in maths. And quite a lot of them were like, oh, wow, these computer things are cool. A lot of them hadn't ever done any programming before. So that's my story. Um, and um, are there any questions or comments? I'll show you a nice conclusion slide to make it feel like that was a satisfying conclusion to the talk.
Okay, cool. Sasha, no, my computer is really powerful. It won't clo crash my browser. I've had several of these running the whole afternoon. Um, it does actually. It should actually walk work in on your phone as well. So, um, if you, uh, we had a little QR code on these um, mugs so that the students could scan in the QR code and get the talk. Um, it turns out that seventeen people in all time actually ever clicked <laughs> managed to scan that QR code, which is fine. Um, I was probably 15 of those 17 people. That also shows that a lot of the students who were coming to this weren't sitting there with like lots of advanced programming and stuff, so it was a new introduction to them. Um, yep, the code for this talk is all available in, um, let me go back. Okay, there you can see it's still code producing things. And this, I've, we've got a repository called UCT Maths Mug on GitHub because we've produced a few of these mugs. I'm actually, my goal was to try and drink through three mugs worth of our different mugs we've produced in the session, but I've dismally failed at that. Um, and it's got a little explanation of this. It's got um, the IPython notebook is here. So if you open that up, it'll show you, um, these are actually my talk notes, and it's got all the code to calculate every single diagram and calculation that was done here. Um, so if you want to dive into that, that's quite easy to explore. Um, if you actually want to run it yourself, there's a little installation document. You need Python and Node.js and Latex and Jupyter, and there's like a few little requirements, but that'll tell you how to set it up. And there's pictures of the mug we made just for fun. And it's actually meant to be transparent, but it turned out they didn't have transparent China to print it on. Um, and then if you want to know more about where you get these kinds of algorithms from, I had to do a little bit of digging to find out the origin of these algorithms. Um, and so you can go and read the original papers that they were developed in and so on. Yes, yeah, so, so the top line of the output doesn't line up with the lines below it. That's because there's a dot in it. Um, so 3.141 is a little bit annoying. Should have made an extra space there, but then it would have thrown my whole web page out. And by the time I'd done this, I didn't feel like doing it again. So we could decree that the dot is implied and take it out. Somebody's reading a book on the birth of calculus with the solving of curves and pi. That is brilliant, Billy. Hope you enjoy that. You could post a link to it in case anyone else is interested. Now, I've obviously talked too fast because I finished before the time that I predicted in my presentation. Um, but I hope that was fun. Should we use green energy to calculate pi? I think some of these, I mean, it's an interesting environmental question. How moral is it to use so many computing resources to calculate pi to multiple places? There are actually interesting things about it. Like there, there are, along with these spigot algorithms, there are some algorithms that let you calculate a particular digit of pi without having to calculate all the ones along the way. So if you want to know, for example, what the 50 millionth digit of pi is, um, you can run one of these algorithms. And so you can actually use that to check. I mean, I don't know if it occurred to you guys, but how do you check that somebody who says they've calculated 50 million digits of pi has got them correct? And so one way of doing it is to use these algorithms to go and do a random subsample of those digits and check that they match another algorithm. And you can actually I guess, use these pi calculations to check that your computers don't generate, generate random errors when they get struck by cosmic rays. So um, if you want to actually run the like hectic pi calculations, there's a program called YY something. Where is it? Um, um, it's, an, it's like, a, it's not an open source program, but you can download it and run it for free, um, which is called Y Cruncher by Alexander Yi. Um, and so you can run this on your own computer. It's a multi-threaded program. He did it as a high school project, and it's now being used to generate all of these records. Um, and so if you want to download that and calculate pi, you can do that. Um, and then there are also other ways of checking that your answers are correct. Cool. Cool. Um... Thank you, David, for a really interesting talk. Um, I'm now going to, um, instead of playing you applause, 
play you the funny sound clip that I found while looking for it was <laughs> at two in the morning. That's much better. I, I appreciate that. And plus, I kind of feel that it feels more genuine if each one is different. Absolutely. But uh, these are some very excited horses. <laughs> Simon, I, you give yourself too little credit. I'm pretty sure that you produced that yourself. Uh, possibly, but I, I didn't <laughs> get it. Very good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, thank you for yet another great talk, and thank you, um, well, uh, you and Hexagon for sponsoring um, PyCon today again um, this year. Um, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, and thank you to all of the attendees. I think, other than um, the the major hiccups <laughs> during the uh, opening uh, presentation, which is perhaps thankfully the least important talk of the day, um, things have gone really smoothly. Um, this is not oh. quite the end of today. So there are two funny events happening, um, uh, starting at about five. Um, the one is going to be a DJ set by Aaron Darcy and uh, some friends. Um, that is um, going to be playing on A11 Radio. You can go to um, www.a11radio.com. There's a link in the announcements um, channel um, in the same place where the links to these rooms are. Um, and there's a Discord channel, and there's hash radio for text and hash v dash radio for voice. Uh, you can join hash v dash radio at the start um, to just kind of hear an, an intro. Um, and then there's going to be a small pub quiz um, happening in Discord. You can join pub quiz or hash v pub quiz uh, for voice and jo join the pub quiz voice channel to say hello and, and sign up. And then tomorrow we'll be um, kicking off um talks again at, at 12 with a short welcome um and then um, we'll be starting off with uh, two parallel talks um one a talk on trio uh, which is a structured concurrency library for python by jeremy thurgood and uh and then in video room two a month in the life of people who sprinkle tech um by jd um, botmer Oh, and the uh, links for those will be announced in Discord and via email again. Uh, emails have been kind of ending up in sp people's spam folders, but uh, hopefully people can either fish in their spam or just come look in Discord. Oh, and thank you. Yeah, thank you again, David. And um, yeah, and thanks everyone for attending. <laughs>